Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to begin this study here, um, taking, uh, leaving where we left off yesterday in Judges 15 and see where we go today. So we need to ask for the Lord's leading. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful uh, for this new day, for the time to study with brothers and sisters in Christ and to continue to learn of you. We pray for your presence here through the, your spirit, through the spirit Spirit of Christ that speaks to our hearts and reveals your character. Help us, Lord, to see wonderful things in your law, in your word. And Lord, we know that the things that you have been showing us are meant to strengthen us and equip us to minister to those around us. I pray for each person's personal ministry for those that we have contact with, that we are um, led to share your truths and to reveal your character. We just pray, Lord, that you can continue to use us and that um, we can see your mighty power working in the hearts of those around us. Be with us now in this study. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, good morning, everyone. Now, yesterday to me was one of those those times when, you know, something unexpected happens. We see something, and it takes us a little while to process it. But uh, the main thing we saw, and I, I did some research on it, and we, we definitely have come to the right conclusion in, in interpreting that. This is Pentecost, the Judges 15 verse 1 is referring to Pentecost, when he goes to visit his wife with this kid of the goats. And um, uh, the real significant thing for me personally just has to do with the paper that I had published. I've, I've sent everyone the link to that who's in my email list. And... Um, especially since there was that one verse, uh, Leviticus 23, verse 21, that had to do with Pentecost and the self same day. And I had originally neglected to put that in the paper. Somehow I missed that when I was going through all the different self same days. So I had to add that to my paper. And um, so that was kind of interesting, just how it happened. And... Um, this this point of the self same day is that this is an anniversary, this Bone Day. So we talked about that yesterday, and we can see how in our lines these things have been significant. So I, I didn't know how to address them in the past. But to me, they were just kind of like uh, like an echo or an aftershock of a date that we had had on our lines, and I would find that one year later, <coughs> those dates would be significant in the structure of the lines. Um, and a, an example that I used, of course, was July 18th. And with July 18th, um, we'd had this presentation uh, on the 160 days that Dwight had done. Um, and, uh, uh, but that, that it, it was, it was I'm, I'm not gonna go through that whole study, but it, it, it was re really this, echo of this um, of July 18th so this is July 18th 2021 that uh, we had this this structure dealing with that and and other dates November 22nd being repeat, repeated uh, things like that so when we look at this on our lines and need to open that. So what, what this helped us to understand is that these two, these are basically the spring first fruits. Um, the Both of them, there's the one that happens with the barley harvest and one with the wheat harvest. And that's going to be 
Collins and Adilio's presentations. And we're going to take these as representing the two lows or the two tables. And, and that means that we're going to take this wheat harvest is Judges 15. Now, um, as, as we're putting this on a line, we have to go through all of Judges 15. So whether that includes all of Judges 15 or we're going to have the story with Samson and Delilah, Delilah being a repeat and in large, uh, I haven't decided yet. Um, so one of the things that happened here with Judges 15 is it, in some ways, it's a continuation of Judges 14, right? So we had in Judges 14, we were brought to uh, this here, this out of the way, right? So we had these 49 days in here, and this is the 20th day of the ninth month. Now, some some people have have said that this is a year later that Samson comes, but I, I don't think that that would be correct. I don't think he's going to wait an entire year. Um, uh, but you know, it could be a month later um, because if 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 we're going to take this this numbering of the days, but it, it's hard to say. Um, and how long there is between when he had the wedding and the riddle and um, then when he comes to the wheat harvest. So it's going to be on Pentecost, though. Now, um, so, so the question is, I guess, going back to Judges 14. I mean, we have these chapters. Of course, the chapters are created by man. Uh, but we see significance in these numbers and the chapters and how they're structured. But if we're going to look at this story, Samson's marriage here, and, and we start reading in chapter 15, uh, the reason that they put a new chapter here, so the reasoning that they're going to use, um, has to do with uh, Haya at the beginning, right? Uh, so it was, right? Or so it came to pass they often look at these sort of dividings um, that are in uh, the Hebrew scriptures. And sometimes there's the paragraph marking sort of things in there, the, which is the end of a scroll. Um, so how they end up coming up with these chapters. Sometimes you can see that there are chapters that really they shouldn't be divided there. And, and I think this is probably the case with this one. That is chapter 15 is a continuation of chapter 14. Uh, for the first part, right? And um, you know, so I don't know if we where we're going to take the rest of this chapter, and you know, and then we're going to get the story of Delilah. So that's going to be a, another story. So maybe fourteen and fifteen just go together. I haven't decided, right? So you know, how these, these stories work, but it could be that the story of Delilah is going to be this repeat and enlarge, and chapter 15 is carrying on this, uh, this structure. Now, now, one of the things about 15 verse 1, what else do we notice about Judges 15 1? Just the, the chapter 15 1, the number there. You have one five one, so the fifteenth day of the first month. Okay, right. So fifteenth day of the first month. Uh, we can connect it to the shekels. Okay, so the to the shekels, right? So the hundred fifty one shekels. That's if we're using a mana of sixty rather than fifty, right? So it gives us an extra 25 uh, shekels. And, and so that was the one that brought us from uh, 1888 to 2014 in Parminder's uh, understanding of those shekels. All right, so we had the 126 shekels, or pardon me, from 1863 to 2014. So he had 126 shekels from 1888 to 2014. 
using that 126 shekels that we had from 1863 to 1989. So the difference was the 25, but so you could use the 151 from 1863 to 2014 as well. So they gave us a second witness for 2014. Um, now, when we deal with 2014, and this is maybe a bit more complicated of a question, but back in 2017, how did I understand 2014 and 2017? Does anybody know how I understood that? This is connected to Samuel Snow's letters. I remember you had 2014 connected to sunset. Okay, right, because uh, Chowatu was was connecting 2014 to sunset, and and I was trying to understand uh, the the Passovers, right? So you have a Passover prior to sunset, because sunset would be April 19th, right, in Millerite history, because if midnight is July 21st, well. Sunset has to be April 19th, right? Just logic. Um, now, but we had the two Passovers, the one on the one side and the one on the other. But we know connected with Passover is Pentecost. And so Samuel Snow had this, this first letter that was written on the date uh, that the temple was dedicated in 515 BC, the biblical date. Um, and and then he had it published on Passover, the first Passover, uh, the one that was on April 3rd, 1844. And then his second letter was published on Passover, um, May 2nd, 1844. So that's the correct Passover. And in between that, of course, is April 19th. And then his third letter uh, was written on Pentecost. Right. And that's the one that was published um, five days later. So it was, it was written on the 6th of Savannah, or the sixth day of the third month, which, of course, becomes this symbol in that history as well, dealing with the 63 days, um, which is part of the structure. And then and then you're going to have um, it republished five days later or published five days later, which is the 11th day of the third month, which doubled becomes. Uh, June 22nd, and Pentecost happened to be June 22nd. So it goes back to the date that it's written. It's in this sort of a self-referencing symbol. And so the way that I was trying to address this, um, uh, so there's a comment there in the chat from Iran to dealing with 151. So Jesus Christ, the normal sum equals uh, 151, and Apollyon and Abaddon, the normal sum equals 151. That's kind of interesting in English, English, English gematria. So anyway, so I was look, looking at 2014 and saying, well, that's going to be this date in between these two uh, Passovers. And then... Well, Pentecost would be 2017. So this is how I was understanding it in 2017. So my my view then at the time is that, you know, we were at that place within Samuel Snow's letters. Now, July 18th ends up being his fourth letter, right? That's the one that's three days before midnight. And it's really July 18th that's going to end up symbolizing the prediction before before midnight, and it ends up becoming, um, because on September 23rd, I presented this at Lambert Church regarding July 18th being the prediction before midnight. It's the end of that structure of Samuel Snow's letters. And then three days later, he presents um, uh, July 18th. Now, we can see if you go from July 17th, July 18th symbol, and you go to 2020, you can see that that becomes three days later. Right, 2020 is three three years after um, uh, 
September 23rd, not exactly to the day, but do you understand what I mean? It's three years. So we go from 2017 and we can count three days uh, to 2020. And, it, and it's interesting too, September 23rd on the biblical calendar is the first day of the seventh month. So it's beginning a year and it's also ending a um, uh, year, what, what the Jews would call in a shorthand is 777 is its year, uh, I believe, 5777. And, and it's September 23rd is, of course, 777 days before November 9th, 2019. So, I mean, so it's, it, it's very interesting how all these things fit together as far as understanding 2014-2017 um, and then 2020. So we can see in some ways that that was fulfilled in that context, Samuel Snow's letters end on July 18th. Now, here we're applying this, though, to our history, right? So we're taking this, this story of Judges uh, chapter 15, and we're saying that it's going to be connected with our history here, so how do we how do we do this? I mean, how do we we take something that we could apply earlier in our history, but now we're applying it really to you know 2021, the end of our 777 structure. Oh, so Samuel asked the question, why have we not yet come to midnight? Isn't it? So uh, I mean, this is one of the things we're going to go through in the line simply presented. Uh, because we've gone through it a number of times, but just to explain the idea of midnight, midnight is what, what way mark is midnight in a line? I mean, what is midnight? You know, think about Millerite history. Midnight is what? July 21st, 1844 is what? Midway. It's midway. Right? And it's the center of a chiasm. You no, know, the cross is midnight. Now, when we talk about midnight, I mean, we've passed midnight many times, haven't we? Have we passed midnight many, many times? I would think we have in many different ways. Right. So, and, and that, how would we explain that? If we've passed midnight, but we're still looking for midnight, how, how did that happen? Wouldn't it depend what line we're in? Very much. So when we look at midnight that we have, that Jeff was always talking about, that we first found in Millerite history, um, we know that that midnight is in connection with a bigger line than, than the ones that we've passed midnight in already. That is... In Millerite history, if you take midnight what it is, it's July 21st, 1844. And then you have the midnight cry, August 15th, 1844. And then you have the arrival of the third angel's message. And the next thing Ellen White's looking for is Revelation 18, the Sunday law. Now, the Sunday law is going to be followed by the loud cry, which parallels the midnight cry. And then there's going to be a close of probation. So if we were going to look at uh, Ellen White's illustration of what the loud cry is and what the Sunday law is, I mean, the Sunday law then parallels what event in Millerite history? Because if the midnight cry parallels the loud cry and the loud cry comes after the Sunday law, what event in Millerite history parallels 
um, midnight, or not parallels, midnight. What what event? Because um, we have midnight in Millerite history. What event is that in in our line? Wouldn't it be the Sunday law? Because if the loud cry parallels the midnight cry, the midnight cry comes after midnight, right? So midnight must be the Sunday law. Does, do you follow that, that logic? No disagreement. Okay. So when we talk about midnight... In Ellen White's line, we're talking about the Sunday law itself, right, as a repetition of history. You know, she doesn't specifically say midnight is paralleled by the Sunday law, but since the loud cry is paralleled, is paralleling the midnight cry, then the Sunday law must parallel midway or midnight for Millerite history. So it's, it's just simple simple logic there's nothing complicated about it but we have a midnight and a midnight cry that precede the sunday law and that's because we're looking at a repetition of millerite history that was originally jeff didn't understand this originally he came to understand it as we began to zoom into the repeat of millerite history we started to recognize that there was this midnight and midnight cry that preceded the sunday law because that's the repeat of Millerite history, the repeat of the first and second angels' messages. And, and since 9-11, we have this repeat of the second angels' message, because 9-11 serves two purposes. It's an empowerment of the first angels' message, and it's the arrival of the second. So what we were having problems with is we were having problems distinguishing what line we were in. So... This midnight that's still future is this midnight on our big line from 1989 to the Sunday law. But that line itself is just a zoom into the Sunday law waymark on Ellen White's line. So once we start to understand the zoom ins, that you zoom into a waymark and you create a reform line that has its own waymarks, and you can zoom into a waymark on that reform line and it's going to have its own waymarks. Now, some of those waymarks will be the waymarks on the line above, right? So we saw this when we went through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, that there's these different reform lines, and that some of the waymarks on Abraham's reform line were also waymarks on Isaac's reform line, but they weren't the same waymark. They served a diff different purpose in Isaac's reform line than they did in Abraham's. Now, this movement got a little bit confused when Parminder started coming in, because originally we were on the right track when it came to the idea of zooming into a waymark, that each waymark typified each other, other waymark, and that each waymark wasn't an, indeed a reform line. But Parminder tried to take this away from us by saying that waymarks cannot typify each other, with no real good reason to say that. Um, and he had this new system of lines, the priest Levites and the Nethanim that were staggered. And, and this really brought more confusion in because he actually brought in another line as well, um, which was the line of the 144,000, which made no sense. Um, and then claimed that the 144,000 were only the priests, not the Levites, which of course is wrong. And he had some reasons for it, but he was mixing analogies and mixing lines and taking things out of context. So I'm not going to go into all of that, but I knew it was wrong right from the beginning because I understand the 144,000 based on the spirit of prophecy. So he had to reject the spirit of prophecy to do that. So, so that's answering your question. And it's an important question because here, when we're looking at our history and we're looking at all of these different stories, these different lines, we zoom into different waymarks on these different lines. So when we zoomed into, um, you know, we zoomed into this 
way mark here when we are ju studying Judges 13, this became a zoom into July 18th. When we were studying Judges 14, this is really a way mark centered around uh, the 20th day of the ninth month, right? December 25th, 2021. And we might argue argue here that we're still in Judges 15, we're still addressing this latter part of this reform line. Because Judges 2019, the whole point here is this first day of the 10th month and the first day of the first month. Right? So, so we've um, established some things about this, that this connects us to April 5th, 2030. It connects us to the end of Colin's study. It's a period of 88 days in uh, Ezra chapter 10. Uh, and we took the 88 days as eight as a day for a month. And 88 months is the exact same time from the end of January 11th, 2023 to April 5th, 2030. That's 2,640 days. And then we found another way to arrive at that as well, going from the first day of the 10th month and taking these 30 day, uh, 30 times 30 plus 30 plus 30 to be 2,658 days if we uh, used months of 29.53. So, so we're multiplying a month of 29.53, which is the actual length of a lunar month, by three uh, 30 day months. And that's going to give us 2,658 days, which goes to April 5th, 2030 as well. So there was these, this second witness. Now, then, if we, we look at this, this is just a continuation of this, right? So now, we, we left these waymarks here from, from the other one. We haven't actually addressed them yet. But... You're going to see um, a divorce happen here, right, in, in Judges 15. Am I correct in that sense? Because Samson gets married in Judges 14, but is he divorced in Judges 15? Or, or do we need to understand? Oh, it yes, okay, Stephen first. Yeah, I'm thinking like Joseph, when he was uh, due to be married to uh, Mary. Yeah. Or whatever, he sort of uh, put her away secretly. He was going to do that, but then he continued. So I'm just wondering, would that would have been a, a divorce if he had done that? or Because I'm just thinking it's more like... A, not just maybe carrying out the marriage. You know, you maybe wouldn't say the marriage is complete yeah. until it's consummated. Well, yeah, but yeah, and that's why, I mean, when I'm saying divorce here, it's basically, it's not quite the same. But in, in Jewish law, I mean, you're married, you have to, it's, it's a contract, right, that's been made, you know, between the families. And so here, this contract would have been broken. So it's a type of divorce, but yeah, it's not an actual, you know, divorce, but their, their system of marriage is very different from ours. Angela, you had a thought? Is that Angela? No, I was just pointing out that it, it's in, in Judges 15 too, where his wife, wife is put away, but he, but this is involuntarily, like it's nothing to do with him wanting that to happen. No, I know, but I'm just, I'm just trying to put the parallel there to the story of Ezra. Right, which which we're using here. Yes. Okay. Right. So there is this this separation that happens from a wife, right? It, it's you know however you want to look at it. I mean, this is, I mean, this is a little bit different story, but, um, you know, his wife is put away in some way. He doesn't do it. You know, the 
the family just does it. They break the contract. They didn't think that Samson wanted to marry her. They thought he utterly hated her, right? That's what the dad says. So, so he's, she's given to someone else, but then is offered the younger sister, right? So the younger sister, of course, I'm saying is, is Omega, but this is, um, This is about God's providence in, in what has happened in our lives. It's being presented in this story, which we would call, you know, ironically moral or morally ironic, I guess. Um, but people are being given a choice, a life and death choice. Now, that this happens at the time of wheat harvest, so we know that it happens at Pentecost, and it it connects us to these two presentations, Collins and Adilio's. So then we have to figure out what the rest of this story is. Samson said, concerning them, now shall I be more blameless than the Philistines, though I do them a displeasure. And Samson went and caught 300 foxes. So the thing about the 300 foxes is this ties us to the story of Gideon, right? And we had placed the 300 in connection with July 18th. So this is going to reference us back to this story of the 300. But we're saying that this is, at, at this point, um, are we going to go back there? So are we going to take these first three verses, sort of address this period of the divorcement with them, or are we going to continue on with this story? Because the 300 foxes would generally bring us back, but could this be a repeat of history? That is, can we take this story of Pentecost and recognize that it's a type of anniversary? It's a type of repeat of history. Even though, even though it brings us to the end of this line, that in a sense, our movement is now repeating a history that we've already experienced, a sense given a second chance or something like that. I'm not sure how to how to put it. But we go through we go through something. We're going through something right now, which which is based upon an anniversary. And so I, I still don't know how to characterize it. I hope people can understand what I'm saying. Because so Samson catches these 300 foxes. Now, what do these foxes represent? Now, so we, there was talk about whether they're a jackal or whatever it is. I, I don't know if that particularly matters um, because we're not really sure what these animals are. But we do have the symbol of a fox, which we can connect to Herod. And, and we haven't addressed that symbol yet. Why yeah, there's that. Yep. There's an application you can do through, I think it's Ezekiel 17, mm -hmm. 16, 13. Talks about um, foxes as false prophets. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, we, so, yeah. So that's, and that's how we were really applying it before when we went through this before. Okay. So here, I'm going to go back. Um, yeah, give me the exact reference of that, but I'll go back here and just how we were looking at this before. So when we looked at chap chapter 15 before, we weren't attaching it as, as we are now to, to, to the end of this line. We had gone back to 9-11, right? And we're just going to go through that history again of, of what 9-11, or not 9-11, but we start at 9-11 or 11-9, right? And then we're going to have the story of July 18th. And, and so these 300, we're just taking the symbol of the 300, that's Gideon's, right? So we're connecting that. But we didn't really sort a lot of this out. So it's Ezekiel 13, verse 4, uh, dealing with the false prophets. So in Ezekiel 13, 4, it's where, O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes of the de desert, right? So this is the false prophets being condemned, right? Okay, but if we are going to properly follow Miller's rules in this, mm -hmm. 
shouldn't we also be looking at Nehemiah 4, 3 and Song of Solomon 2, 15? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to look at all the foxes, right? Okay. Yep. Yeah. We always do that. So um, here, I'll just put in foxes. So the, the foxes spoil the vine. That's Song of Solomon. It's one of my scripture songs. Uh, take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. Um, uh, and that and that word take just means capture for us. Um, so Song of Solomon is a little bit uh, kind of obscure. A lot of people don't recognize all these different symbols and how they, they fit. Um, like who the Shulamite is and stuff is is important but anyway in verse 14 it says oh my dove that that art in the clefts of the rock in the secret places of the stairs let me see thy countenance let me hear thy voice for sweet is thy voice and thy countenance is comely so this is a revelation of christ correct this is moses in the cleft of the rock would we agree with that I'd have to think about that for a bit. Well, <laughs> he's in the cleft of the rock and uh, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice. And the countenance here is the word mara, right? That's um, that's the one that deals with the 2300 days. Right, the mara vision. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> now we have the Mara, this one, and the Mara, right? So this is the Mara. And so this is the 2300 days, this word secret. Okay, and then you have, so you have the cleft of the rock, you have this revelation of Christ. And, you know, I make the argument, it doesn't matter whether it's, uh, I, I take the 2300 days as a revelation of Christ as well, but it's just not the, the, uh, the form that we have is the looking glass. Okay, and then you have uh, the stairs and ma madrega. What's that, madrega? Anybody know what the, the places of the stairs, what that would be an understanding of? That relate really to the ladder. Okay. Jacob's yeah. So I would think, even though it's not really the same word or anything, um, but but it would be something like this: that the ladder that connects heaven and earth. Because let me see thy countenance. Right. And then, and then you're going to have this whole thing. See that countenance again? That's Mara. And then for the Mara is comely. That's Neva. That's Hebrews number five thousand. Suitable, beautiful. And then it says, "Capture for us the foxes." Right? Seize us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. Right, and it's going to lead up until the daybreak and the shadows flee away. Turn away, my beloved. Be thou like the roe or the young heart upon the mountains of Beether. Um, Feedeth among the lilies. So this is, uh, if we're going to talk about the day breaking, that's going to be the morning, right? Uh, it's kind of uh, uh, the day here is um, um sort of like an account of or whatsoever it's it's kind of a funny word so uh daniel puts here september 11 2001 9 11 2001 9 plus 11 plus 2001 equals 2021 okay that's 19 plus 11 which is 20 so that wouldn't that give us 2020 
uh, let me see, 2021. Yes, you're right, 2021. So 19 plus 11 is 20, plus 2001 is 2021. Okay, so I'm not sure why we have that, but there it is. And um, so we have this 2014, 2017 in these two verses, hiding in the cleft of the rocks is 2014 and uh, Song of Solomon, uh, until the daybreak, the shadows flee away. That's 2017. That's okay. the way I'm reading this. All right. I, you made your point as to what how you're seeing it, so I'm, I'm going to ask a counterpoint. Okay. Who's speaking? Uh, this is uh, the Shulamit, I think. This it's, is really hard to tell, okay? Um, so this could be Christ speaking. So this could be... Uh, uh, Um, so it's really hard to tell. So that because it's constantly changing back and forth. And I've I studied Song of Solomon in detail, uh, trying to figure out who was speaking when. And so often when it says, Oh my dove, that's normally the Shulamite speaking to the beloved. So I, I'm gonna ask it in this way. Yeah. Is it possible this is the 144,000 beholding Christ? Well, I think that's the whole point of it. So, so the way that I understand the Song of Solomon, so you have the Shulamites. So if you go back to the Song of Solomon, um, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, right? The Song of Songs. So you got a doubling here, correct? Okay. You have several doublings. Yes, but but it's the Song of Songs. So that's a doubling, right, which is Solomon's. And then it's going to start out, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. So this is the Shulamite speaking, we're going to find out, right, because of the savor of thy good ointments. The name is as an ointment poured forth, therefore do the virgins love thee. So you're going to have all these symbolism that you could use in the parable of the ten virgins. You, you know, there's... All things, this chamber, you can look at these things as the curtains being in the sanctuary, um, you know, the trues, the vineyards, right? And then uh, there's going to be other people involved here. You're going to have uh, a beloved who's who really goes unnamed. Um, and then you have the Shulamite, who is, of course, the feminine form of the, of the name Sh Solomon, right? So in a sense, this is a love poem in the style of the day that Solomon writes where it's talking about God's love towards him. That's the way that it would be understood. Um, and then you're going to have uh, Sol the, the beloved is going to talk about um, the bride, the woman, right? All of her characteristics. Um, but you're going to see that a lot of these, we wouldn't use these in uh, love poetry today. Um, but a lot of these are, are symbols. Um, the beams of our house are cedar and the rafters of fir. There's all of these different sort of very rich imagery that you see in the Song of Solomon. Now, when it says, I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys, that's the bride speaking. That's not the beloved speaking, right? But we know there's a hymn, you know, he's the rose of Sharon, he's the lily of the valleys. But actually that's that's referring to Solomon who represents in a sense the church because he's the king, right? Uh, he's the Shulamite. Um, he brought me to his banqueting house and his banner over me was love, right? So this is the Shulamite speaking. Uh, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. So lovesick, right? His hand under is under my head, and his right hand doth embrace me. I charge ye, O daughters of Jerusalem, by thy rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please, right? So there's 
there's going to be these daughters of Jerusalem that are going to be part of this narrative as well. And then the bride adores her beloved, right? The voice of her beloved. Uh, the bride adores her beloved. The voice of my beloved. Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. And so she describes her beloved. Um, so, and then the beloved spakes and said, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear on the earth, etc. The fig tree putteth forth her gra grapes. And then, oh, my dove, thou art the clefts of the, in the clefts of the rock. This is the Shulamite speaking again. Right. So that's how I understand this. But you'll see different people commenting on this and they have different ideas about it. But that's how I understand it. So the question is, is this the 144,000? Well, Solomon, as the king, does he not represent God's people? Because Solomon's here is the bride. Is the bride represent God's people? Yes. I would think that that's a better definition. Okay. Okay. So, so the bride represents God's people. Now, we know that the king is a type of Christ. The Christ also does represent God's people. Right? I mean, the character of Christ, when his character is perfectly reproduced in his people, then he shall come to claim them as his own. Comment in the chat there. Okay. Yeah, so you're just taking the vines having tender grapes. Um, Connecting us to 9-11, because the sum is 9-11, that verse. And the reverse is 13-5-3-3. So we have all those symbols of the 13-35 and the 15-33 in there, and the 153. Um, in, in the reverse, uh, that would be the reverse Bible verse. So that's... The thirteen thousand five hundred and thirty-three verse from the end from the end of the Bible, Iran. Yeah. Okay. So if you count from the end of the Bible, that's the verse. But it being nine eleven, I think is even if you look at the idea of the vines themselves, they have tender grapes. This is referring to. Um, how would we connect that with 9-11? I mean, this more means that the vines are in blossom. Tender grapes would be refer often to them being in bloom. Would not that be 9-11? They're budding, the budding fourth, right? Isn't that what we tied to 9 11? Yep. Yeah, it connects with uh, Isaiah chapter 27, verses 8, I think, or 6, 6 and 8. Isaiah 27, verses 6. He shall cause them to come of Jacob to take root. Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the whole world with fruit. And in verse 8, in measure, when it shooteth forth, thou wilt debate with it. He stayeth the rough wind in the days of the east, in the day of the east wind. So Jeff has always applied this to 9-11. So I think we can safely do that uh, here. <clears throat> so when, when we're looking at the, at the Song of Solomon and these foxes. And so it's asking to capture the foxes. So the foxes do bring us to 9-11. Now, 
Uh, the other verses that we had that were mentioned before, I mean, I mentioned, of course, Herod being a fox, which would be a reference to him being uh, not so much a false prophet, but who did who was Herod claiming to be? What was the role of Herod? Wasn't he sort of considered to be the king of the Jews, so to speak? He's trying to take over the title of king of the Jews. Is he not? Uh, he had been set as the king of the Jews by the Romans. Right. So the Romans put him as king of the Jews. He considers himself the king of the Jews. Um, but Jesus calls him a fox which I think would just mean that he's, he's a counterfeit, right? Like that's why the, the false prophets are foxes. They're, they're counterfeits. They're but you, counterfeit. Jesus was, was speaking not of Herod the Great, but as, as one of his successors. So it's, he's basically, isn't he saying that all of the Herods are as foxes? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, this is obviously not Herod the Great. You know, this is the other Herod, the one that took the head of John the Baptist. Right? So, but yeah, he's still considered to, you know, to be the king of the Jews. They, they put the, the Herod family in charge of, of Judea, right? So they're, they're supposed to be the, the rulers, the leaders, right? Of course, and that's why you have different groups. You have the Herodians who believe that Herod is the true king of the Jews. You have the Zealots who want to overthrow the Romans, right? You have these different groups. Uh, so the Herodians and the Zealots, of course, are at odds with each other. <clears throat> okay. So that, that does make, um, helps us a little bit with this symbol of the foxes. So the foxes that spoil the vines at 9-11, what are those that need to be captured? Um, okay, well, Romulan, Romulus and Remus were fed by wolves, not foxes, but... Uh, there is some similarity. It's just there in the chat. Um, so that he's called a fox. So that has to do with the history of Rome. I don't know. I don't. I would I would take it more that it refers to that 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 he's a false representative. He's not the true king, but. So the Herod that was, that caused the death of John the Baptist, was that Herod Antipas? Yeah, I believe so. I always get them mixed up, but I think it's Herod Antipas, yeah. So this is Herod Antipas, the one using Antipas in its meaning that is like the father. Yeah. So he's representing his father, Herod the Great, but is he also not a false representation of God the father? Okay, I, I don't follow. Wasn't he the one that died? He sort of uh, said he was like a god. Right. Yeah. He an yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he's a counterfeit. Correct. Yeah. Okay, that, that's what we understand here. Foxes represent something that's a counterfeit.
Now, so Samson capturing these 100 foxes then, or 300 foxes, pardon me, um, and he puts firebrands between their tails. Um, we know that this represents a chiasm, right? A midst, in the midst between two tails. And we know the tails also represent false prophets. Correct? Yes. So, so we have two different symbols here that can relate to false prophets. Okay, so we, so if we're looking at, well, the one thing you know is if there is a false, there is a true. But, but here in the story of Samson, we're just looking at these symbols of what the, they mean. So Samson, he has to catch these 300 foxes. Now we put the 300 as, as Gideon's 300 um, as a symbol. Do we attach these two symbols together or is this a counterfeit? I would be thinking we would have to attach the symbols together because you have 300 men with their pitchers and torches. Here you have 300 boxes. Right. Yeah, we're, we definitely tie them together that way. But I'm just saying, is this a counterfeit of the other 300? I mean, the counterfeit has to have the same uh aspect to it right now you got the 300 but here you have foxes and tails now samson's going to capture these foxes right just like in the song of solomon take us the foxes capture us the foxes and so you have all of this but and they're also though going to set them among the standing corn right so here you have the beginning of the wheat harvest, this is Pentecost. And he's going to take these foxes and let them loose in the wheat fields. Right, and they're going to burn up the corn and the vine vineyards and the olives. So is this something that we go back and we look at and we say, well, this, this deals with July 18th and the 300 who do this proclamation of July 18th, because that's how we dealt with the 300 before? Or do we take this 300 as a counterfeit message that has to be undone, right? And if we look at this in connection with this divorce, is this telling us about the divorce that happens in this movement? Is this capturing of these 300 foxes and them setting them, the tails on fire and putting them amongst the wheat, is that the work that is going to be happening now in this movement? With what we're talking about here, the torches are producing two things. Mm -hmm. What two things are they? Well, they're going to produce light. Yes. And and heat. Okay. Now it's going to be light in the fields, but it's also going to be heat, which will destroy the fields. Right. Now, I'm assuming that we're looking at this literally and not figuratively. Okay, what do you mean by that? I'm not sure what you mean literally. I mean, we're only looking at this as a symbol. Okay. Cool. 
but we're look at, looking at it then as a symbol. We're not looking at it ironically, or are we? Okay. So when we look at the ironic nature that has to do with the moral aspects of Samson himself, we can't take every aspect of the story and flip it around. That's not what the ironic, because that's what some people keep, have been trying to do all the time is sort of say, well, we have to take this and do the opposite, but that's not what the moral irony is, is telling us. We look at the moral aspects of Samson's character. His character is not a Christ-like character in what he's doing. So, so we, we, we just say all of these things that are showing that Samson is bad, we're going to recognize that this is the work of Christ. Samson is a good symbol not a bad symbol. Then what he's doing, these actions that he's doing, we look at the symbols of these actions, like the symbols that are used in these stories of all these different events. And we just understand those sim symbols in, in their normal sense. We don't try to flip them around. We don't say foxes, which are bad or false prophets, that these are then true prophets, right? We're going to say that foxes and tails and all these things, we're just going to take those in their normal sense. That is, this is false prophets. And Samson, who's a good symbol, he's going to capture these false prophets. And he's going to use them to burn up the wheat harvest. And this wheat harvest is the wheat harvest of the Philistines. Right. So the doctrines, the vineyards, the all of these are all this false part of our message that still exists within the message. Because we've understood that the purpose of Samson, the purpose of that message is to correct God's people. So God's people have these false teachings, these false understandings, these false doctrines, false ways of studying God's word. And so. That's how we've understood Samson to be, right, as a symbol. He represents Christ, but morally he's, he doesn't. Does that help, that explanation? Or does anybody disagree with it or have something to add to it? There was a comment in the chat mm -hmm. giving reference to Hebrews 12, 29. Okay, so. For our God is a consuming fire. Okay. Yeah, so what we're looking at in this story uh, of Judges 15, I mean, this is the work of God in correcting this movement. That's how I understand it. Would, would, and, and that's what Samson represents. He represents that, you know, he's sunlight. Okay, so uh, do, do we know the year? I don't think so. We can't we can't narrow down Samson to a year because that was a question in the chat. Now, also from the chat, as as we were talking before, apparently we have missed a verse in this consideration. Yeah, Nehemiah four three. Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, "Even that which they build, if a fox go up." He shall even break down their stone wall. The book verse is 67. The reverse sum is 1629 combined 2781. 
Right. So this is the opposition to the work of building the streets and walls. Right? Well, this is the walls specifically. Right. And you have this Ammonite. Um, and, and this is um, Tobiah the Ammonite saying this, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Right. So, so this is we go back but it came to pass that when Samballot heard that we builded the wall he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews so this is a mockery of their wall right so but this but anyway the interesting thing about this verse is the reverse sum is 66 but well, the book verse is 66 pardon me the reverse sum is 1629 and the combined sum is 2781. So that's going to be the 18th of July, 2020. Right, July 18, 2020, the combined. And the 1629, that's Odilio's number. Um, and that's one thing to, to point out, too, about this 1629, because uh, this is the number that Odilio brought out on February 12th, 2022. And what's the significance of the 1629? It has all of these uh, numerical relationships to other numbers that we have, right? It's also the length of the siege, I think. That's the length of the siege from when... Uh, no, no, it's not. It's actually just from when uh, Ezekiel began to predict the siege to when the, the siege occurred. Right. Yeah, so from when the siege is predicted to when the siege occurs. So that's from um, July 21st, uh, 592 BC to uh, the 10th day of the 10th month in um, 587 BC, right? So that's going to be whatever is January 8th or something. I can't remember the date. Right, so it's going to be 1629 days. So, so, and we already use 1629 in connection with um, our lines. So, but the fact that it's here in this verse that talks about the fox, what would be the significance of that? We have the July 18 and the 1629 and the fox. So, Is there any, so it's the 66th verse of that book of Nehemiah, the gematria of the verse is 1629 in reverse sum and the combined, and that means uh, if you took 2781 and you subtracted 1629, you would get the, the regular sum. So whatever that number is. But how are we going to see the significance of what's being talked about here with this mocking of the Ammonite? Is this an attack upon July 18th that's being talked about? Is there an attack of, of, upon July 18th in the movement presently? Yes. But is it done in a fox-like way? Yes. Right. And, 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 and we see this as the division that exists in the movement, right? Right. Correct. So the, ex the division that exists is not done in the open, right? It, it's done in, for lack of a better word, an underhanded way. Satan doesn't work in the open, he works in the dark. He works by insinuation. He doesn't address things directly. In secret. It, yeah, it's in, in secret, but in a secret in a bad way, not in the secret like Palmoni. So, you know, so this, this is, 
I mean, I would say that the fox here represents an attack upon the message. And we know the walls were built in 52 days. Day for a year, 52 years is a prophetic 18720 days, right? So if we take the 52 days that the walls are built, they represent July 18th. So we can see that the walls that are being mocked are July 18th. Now, now who is this Tobiah the Ammonite? Like as a symbol. His name means the goodness of Jehovah. Uh, but he's an Ammonite, right? So, right, he's not part of the children of Israel. Okay, right. And he's mocking. But his name means the goodness of Jehovah. Um. Right, we know that it's the son of Lot. Right. Name sort of means that it relates to being inbred. Son of, because Ammon means uh, literally, what's the word? Because, you know, it's Ammon, it's, it's uh, you know, Am, Ami, my people, right? So Ammon, it's, so it has to do with being inbred anyway. Um, I can't remember, there's another, something else to it there. So this mocking of July 18th. We can see that this fox then relates to this symbol, right? Correct. The foxes are known as being crafty. They're known as being sly, secretive, yeah. destructive. Mm-hmm. So here's Tobiah was by him. Now, who's the him? Um, this is going to be uh, just at the beginning. It talks about uh, either it's going to be um, Sam Ballot who's mocking. No, I mean, Tobiah is the one that's doing the mocking, but Sanballat is who he's, who he's with. Right. Well, he mocked. It says it came to pass when Sanballat heard that they, we built the wall. He was wroth and he took great intonation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now, Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall break down their stone wall, right? So, so Tobiah is standing by Sanballat, and he's basically seconding what Sanballat's saying. Yeah, yeah, well, he's, yeah, so he's seconding it. Um, and, and in a sense, he's, he's saying, you know, also, he's kind of saying, well, what they're doing isn't going to isn't going to last, right? So, so this is the fox. So this message of the fox, we can tie back to Judges fifteen. Well, if we if we also look just a little further down, Nehemiah four seven gives you Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabians. 
the Ammonites and the Ashdodites. Yep. So you have five. Okay. So are these the five foolish virgins? Well, I would think so. So those that are not only mocking July 18th, they're also mocking the 2520. They're standing, they are off the platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they also are conspiring, all of them together, to come and fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Right. Okay. So now there's 300 foxes here in the story of Samson, and, and we then can take this to represent that this is a counterfeit of the 300 of Gideon, which is where, where I would look at here. So I'm not going to take this. So what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to take this story and take this 300 foxes and then turn the symbol around to represent 300 um, of Gideon, right? I'm going to say that we have here a counterfeit of Gideon. And this is what Samson is going to capture. And Samson, even though he's morally bad, he's a good symbol. And so, so this message of Samson is going to defend the truth against the attacks that are happening in this movement. And, and it's going to be done by this chiasm. So Samson's going to put these 300 foxes tail to tail, put a firebrand in the midst between the two tails. And he's going to use this to destroy the teachings, the understandings, the, the system of study, however you want to look at it, the Protestant system of study that, that has taken over this movement. And the thing is, we don't know it. Right. See, this is part of the problem that it's um, we've inherited things from Adventism that we don't want to let go. What are those things that we inherited from Adventism that we don't want to let go? Some would say a misunderstanding of righteousness by faith. Okay, well, that's that's the symptom. I mean, I don't know if that's the root of the problem. I mean, yes, there is a misunderstanding of righteousness by faith, but that could be easily remedied if we could get rid of the other major problems of Adventism that we've inherited. So the one is we don't want to look like a cult, right? Right. Okay. So we want to be accepted. We want to be popular. Um, we also don't want to have anything to do with time prophecy. Right? That's what the, the corporate church is fighting, yes. Yeah, it's like uh, the guy who read my paper uh, the other day. Yesterday, I guess it was. Um, to the to talk yeah, so he went to the pastor of his local church a few months ago, uh, of an Adventist church. So I don't know if the guy's an Adventist, but he went to an Adventist church, attended it, waited till after the service, had to wait till all the way to the end. And then he wanted to ask this pastor something about time prophecy. And the pastor said, I don't have time for that. Okay. So he said, you know, it doesn't appear that Adventists are very interested in looking at time prophecy. And so he was impressed with my paper. One is the precision in the paper, but also just that we have this interest in time. So I don't, you know, know a lot about him yet, 
but uh, you know, we're, he's going to be reading my paper. I sent him a link to some of my presentations. Um, but uh, the point here being that Adventists don't have an interest in time. I mean, why was the 2520 so strongly opposed um, in the Adventist church? Like, Jeff wasn't really that opposed. There was a few people who knew about him who didn't agree with him, mostly people from his past um, or had connections with really conservative Adventism. But when the 2520 came out, why, why was there so much opposition? But what, on, just on the surface. What did people think the 2520 was? A distraction. Well, they thought it was time setting, yeah. right? Okay. Like the first, the first person who ever said something to me personally about the 2520 in a negative sense said, so you think Jesus is going to come back in the year 2520 or 2025 or something, right? All they caught on is that there's a number there that could be a date that might be connected with time setting in some way. So it's obviously wrong. They, had, they didn't know anything about it. It's just, it's time setting, right? Well, I think a lot of people just thought it was distraction from 2,300 days. That this is something mm -hmm. that wasn't gonna be part of their evangelism program to talk about the 2520. They just yeah. thought, People don't need to hear about this here. Let's just focus with the basics of 2,300 days and so forth. That was how I got it. I didn't really sense much about that was really relating to time setting. Yeah. Well, I never ran into that. So, so your experience is different than mine on that, that point. Um, Yeah, so SDAs also have a bias on prophecies. They call it excitement. So anytime you're, you're looking at uh, the 2520, I just think back to the presentation I saw uh, or saw, I heard, I listened all I, to. All I ever had was people ignored it, wouldn't even talk to me about it. Yeah. So it might be depending on the time in which you first come into the 2520 and how people saw it, but. In 2010, people thought it was time setting. That's what I remembered. Um, but, you know, Stephen would have known about the 2520 before 2010. So he would have been following FFA. W when were you following FFA, Stephen? Started 2009. 2009, yeah. So, <clears throat> so you might have come the initial and also you're in uh, the UK. So there's a little bit of difference there, but whatever the experience is, the point is that Adventists have, have inherited this fear of time. And, and, and in a sense of fear of prophecy. Now, I think it was um, the guy from Arkansas. Uh, I can't think of his name offhand, but he did a presentation where he, he spoke against Jeff Pippinger. And he uh, tried to say that it was weird, was he? No, 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 no. Sorry. No. no, he spoke against Jeff and he sort of, yeah, yeah, Eugene Pruitt, that was it. And, and he talked about all the excitement, you know, how, how they're all just excited, you know, like shaking like this and they're all just so excited. And, oh, it's, and, and I'm thinking, like, obviously, you know, it's not really anything that I ever saw about Jeff. The only thing uh, I know that some of Jeff's videos when he had that, that microphone that went by his mouth and he'd always breathe into it, you know, it, it could have maybe sounded like he was excited or something or angry, maybe. Or angry. but uh, I, I, I saw this movement as a pretty cerebral and basically devoid of excitement. So, so I didn't think that that was a, uh, an, an honest depiction, but I think that many people think of or they fear excitement, right? So if if somebody's presenting something, and I've had that accusation against me, oddly, that somehow um, I'm, you know, presenting things that are sensational that within the movement. This was uh, a characterization that. Uh, 
is made of me uh, by several different people at when we were at the School of the Prophets is I was always looking for the sensational. Oddly, I think one of them was Tanya Beeman, um, which really make no sense uh, because she tends to like the sensational. Now, all of the things that we found, I mean, they are pretty exciting in a sense, but I don't dig up, you know, just to have like the next exciting thing, uh, you know, to just keep people like with a carrot, you know, leading them on. I'm trying to understand the truth to dig into scripture. The fact that we find such amazing things in scripture, you know, we're not doing it for some emotional high, but we're doing it because we want to understand the truth. We want to be like Christ. So you know, so these sort of um, attacks that happen on prophecy or what we're doing, uh, they're definitely misplaced. Uh, this this movement would be more uh, about looking at things soberly rather than being caught up in some kind of excitement. But there are people caught up in excitement. I mean, Adventism tends to attract people who like the sensational, uh, partly because of how we did our evangelistic series. But um, so if we're going to look at this, then what, what we've basically dealt with today is this, um, this line. So we go back to our line. <clears throat> Where would we put? So this is the time of the wheat harvest. We have these two messages that are going to be marking Pentecost. So we would have to put the foxes after that. So that means that if we're going to give it a, a date, well, I'm, I'm just gonna do it this way here. Um, we got two dates here, January 11th, December 25th, that we are marking as the 10th day. So I'm gonna put here the foxes. 300 foxes, but it's not how you spell foxes. So that's what I'm going to do. But that's when the 300 foxes are going to be captured. And they started to be captured on December 25th. We'll get to January 11th. Now, remember, we're not like predicting any kind of event here. We're just using this as a symbol of these dates. Because these dates, both these dates represent the first day of the 10th month. Now, Maybe I could put them after the divorcement, but I'm putting them as part of this divorce because this is the action that Samson takes in response to um, his wife being given to someone else. Does this, this seem fair? I mean, at least just tentatively, does this... Would or would we want to put foxes like before or after that date? Or we just because I'm just trying to connect it with the date that we have symbolically. That's why I'm putting it on the date, not between it. So put foxes on December 26th. Uh, so Okay, so that I wouldn't put these. Uh, so there was a question about December 26th and about August 29th, 2019. So we're taking this story of Judges 15 and we're starting it with Colin and Odilia's presentations. So we're not, we're, we're making this a continuation of chapter 14, right? So, so we're saying chapter 14 really shouldn't have ended. Uh, it should have continued with this part of the story regarding the divorce and the foxes. The rest of chapter 15 is going to carry up and pick up another story. I don't think it's going to continue on. <clears throat> okay, so the question regarding December 26, because Daniel's asking that question. Okay, December 25th, 2022, 
which is this anniversary date, this bone date, right? On December 25th, 2022, I'm going to present the study on, uh, what is it? The I can't remember how I titled it. You know, the line simply presented, something like that. Now, that date connects to April 5th, 2030, because it's three months, which is 90 days, times 29.530587 days. So you go from December 25th, 2022, it will bring you to April 5th, 2030, right? Because that's what we understood here. Um, so December 25th, 2022 is 2,658 days before April 5th, 2030. And so that's that 30, 30, 30 that we got from chapter 14. And we're saying that chapter 15 is just a continuation of this. It's going to bring us again to this, this history. It's telling us this history, what's, what this history is about. It's about this divorce and about the removal of the false messages from, from this movement. And that would be all the conspiracy theory messages, um, things that are not following Miller's rules, uh, that do detract from the message, um, the criticisms, of course, uh, those types of things. And then we have January 11th, that's the end of Collins' structure. So that's going to be uh, 88 times 30 days, 2,640, right? So that's just another way we can come to April 5th. So we can use these two different dates to arrive at April 5th. And we're saying that that's when the foxes are captured and let loose in the fields. Okay, so we can pick this up tomorrow, but those are good questions. And uh, I want people to study this out, to think about it a bit. I mean, because there are other ways, you know, to look at this. People could try to take these stories and flip them around. Um, but I don't think that we can do that. They could try to put this earlier. But to me, the Pentecost symbol is just too powerful um, with these 49 days here to, to miss. Okay. Any final thoughts before we pray? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you uh, once again for the time that we have had studying your word here. I pray for each person that they can contemplate these things. If we need to be corrected in our ideas, we ask that you can come and do that, um, that you can show us clearly what your word means. And uh, I pray that you can be with each person. Help them in their health problems, those that we love and care for around us who are struggling, and those even of us who are struggling uh, with the battles that we face in this world. Be with us now. Continue to bless and keep us, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.